So let's say you have to memorize a scene. How do you do that? What do you do to memorize a scene? I've got some tips and some suggestions, and do you memorize your auditions? I'm going to have the answer to what you really should do in just one moment. Welcome to Casting Actors Cast. It's the podcast for actors in the business of show with casting director Jeffrey Dreisbeck. Visit us at castingactorscast.com for more information. Please remember to subscribe and like Casting Actors Cast. Here is your host, Jeffrey Dreisbeck. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Casting Actors Cast. I'm Jeffrey Dreisbach and welcome to today's episode. We're calling this If Memory Serves. It's all about memorization. I know it might sound a little bit tedious, but I'm going to try and make it as entertaining <laughs> and as fun as possible because I think there are some things you need to know about whether you should memorize your scenes or not for an audition. How are you in terms of memorizing your work when you're in a rehearsal? And what happens if your memory isn't as good as it might or should be? So we're going to have those answers to you and give you those answers in just a second. Have a question for Jeffrey? Just go to castingactorscast.com and use the comment form. Jump into the talent pool. It's easy. Here's Jeff with this week's questions. So I'd like to read a letter because this is uh, our mailbag today. And this is a letter that I just got this week that I'd like to share it with you. And I'm going to answer the letter right on the air here. By the way, we're simulcasting with YouTube, so if you have a chance and want to go check out and see what it's like to watch me talking to you while we're doing this, then by all means, please go to YouTube. The channel is called Casting Actors Cast, but I want to give my thanks to Ava Maria. Ava sent me this letter, and I'm going to read the whole letter to you, and then I'm going to answer her questions before we jump into our subject matter called If Memory Serves, all about things memory. Here's the letter. Dear Jeffrey, I've been listening to your podcast on Spotify. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your advice. At the end of your podcast, you encourage listeners to send our questions in. I definitely appreciate this and am looking forward to the free 100-page voiceover career advice ebook download that is available afterwards. Well, that's absolutely true. If you go to castingactorscast.com, there's a, a form called contact form you just simply fill that out just because I like to know who's out there when you fill that out and submit that to me you'll also get a PDF downloadable 100 page free book as Ava says so here's the question I live in Los Angeles am SAG eligible um, SAG after are the uh, unions Screen Actors Guild American Federation of Television and Radio Artists have an agent and I'm thinking about moving to New York in a few years as I keep hearing that, although there are more TV shows in Los Angeles, it is more likely an actor will get cast on a TV show in New York because most of the actors in New York are interested in theater Broadway more than being on a TV show. Is it more likely an actor will get cast on a TV show in NYC than L.A.? If I move to Atlanta after NYC and get day player roles and then come back to Los Angeles, will the day player roles in Atlanta not be considered as valid as if I had just stayed in L.A. and tried to get day player roles there? Wow, that's a lot there, but I really appreciate the question. Thank you so much. By the way, you can do the same thing by going to Casting Actors Cast if there's anything that comes to mind, because I really want to be here to give you as much information, kind of lift the veil about what's going on in the industry. Let me answer her question first and foremost, that although there are so many television shows shooting here in New York, that doesn't mean that because actors are interested in theater that they're not interested in film and television. In fact, I would say that actors are interested more in film and television 
in terms of my experience than in theater. And that reason, I think, is because it's more lucrative, because there are more opportunities in general, rather than just kind of holding out for a Broadway show. And if you don't sing or dance, what are your choices there? I don't think I would necessarily put it in those kinds of categories. But I think that there are a ton of opportunities in New York, especially if you have also an interest in pursuing some theater stuff. I just want to put that out there. The theater scene in Los Angeles isn't quite as aggressive or as fully fleshed out. I don't know if that makes any sense. I guess it does. As it is in New York, only because you've got Broadway and off-Broadway and you've got all kinds of additional things taking place here in New York. Los Angeles is still the king as far as film and television is concerned. I think it's better to take a look at what your interest is and then compare that to the opportunities in those cities that you're taking a look at. Now, day player work is considered great, especially if you're a newcomer to the industry that you haven't had a lot of film or television experience. Being a day player is a really great thing to put on your resume. Guest starring, guest appearances by, those kinds of credits are really excellent to have. Let me also say that there's no real discrimination, and I use that word loosely, with a person who's been a day player in a film in Atlanta with somebody like an agent or a manager or a producer in Los Angeles. Being a day player in a film or television project has its own weight and value, and people don't look at it, in my view, as kind of a negative thing at all. In fact, it bodes well for you if you have several day players on your resume, and you also might have and put together a film reel of you doing various scenes as a day player. So those are really awesome. Whether you're in New York or Los Angeles, those are things that can really serve you well. And kudos to you if you've got an agent in Los Angeles, what do they think? Is there a reciprocity agreement with the Los Angeles agent with somebody in New York? Maybe they can be of help to you there. So there are all kinds of ways to channel it, but you know, broad stroke brushing about whether or not it's cr more credible or less credible or whatever in New York, I, I just don't think that that matters that much. You know, work begets work. That's my experience. So thank you so much again for the question. And if you have a question, once again, anybody out there listening or watching, by the way, we are simulcasting this with YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and I continue to try and make this interesting and uh, entertaining as possible. And I'm hoping that maybe we can build a YouTube audience together as well. So if you have a chance to go to YouTube, I'd really appreciate you picking that up. So today I want to talk to you about uh, the title of today's show is called If Memory Serves. And like I've said in previous podcasts, I sort of wait till something hits me in the head like a wet noodle. Boy, that's kind of a crazy, weird image. But if I get a, like a, a, a Thunderbolt inspirational moment to talk about, and today's inspirational moment actually happened in a class that I was teaching, when a student asked me, are there any tips or hints or suggestions as to how to memorize the script? How to memorize your work? And in theater terms, we say off book. Are you off book? Are you off book? We don't really say that in film because it's so disjointed and film is not shot in sequence most of the time. So it's about, do you have it all memorized or do you know the scene? But off book is sort of that theater term about whether or not you've learned the lines. And so this student asked me that question. I thought, well, that's a really interesting question. Are there some easy, simple ways that you can memorize your work? But that opened up an entire discussion in my head about Actors who come into audition with scenes memorized, and is that really a good thing? Should you take the time and the energy to memorize a scene that you're auditioning with? So I'm going to answer that in a second, but let me start with a story, and that happened this week. And for obvious reasons, I'm not going to use names or uh, the name of the theater or name of the project or anything like that. But it's a project, a theater project that we were casting. And it turns out that the older actor was having some serious memory problems. It was just challenging for him to digest all of the material. And it was a lot of words. It was a lot of script that this actor was having some challenges with. And it turns out that he had a medical situation that really exacerbated um, an already difficult 
thing, which was trying to absorb and digest and be creative with all of this written material. And so the artistic director of the theater called and he was kind of concerned and said, you know, don't do anything yet. I'm going to give him a few more days. And if it continues, we might need to replace the actor. Now, this does happen sometimes. It's a very sad situation because we feel partly responsible. We, after all, brought this actor in. We fully vet the actors just to make sure that they're not only up for it, but they're interested and they want to do the project. But you never know sometimes. You get into a rehearsal situation or you get into a project and sometimes the parameters of the project and the amount of time um, and the stress and the pressure can really make it more difficult for a lot of actors. So... It made perfect sense. And of course, we were nervous because we thought, well, if you're giving it a few more days for this to see if this actor can kind of get it together to, to, to memorize the words and it doesn't work out, you've lost like three more days of rehearsal for a new actor if that's in fact what we need to do. So uh, that's in fact what we did. We found another actor. And um, this actor was just a lovely, lovely actor. We had known his work. We plugged him into the role. And what was miraculous, and he was the same age as the other actor that we were replacing. Um, we felt very badly about that, but he graciously bowed out. It wasn't an, uh, uh, an ugly situation by any means. And the new actor had come in, and by the time he started his first rehearsal, that new day, I guess he took like 24 hours to get on a plane and then get down to the theater. He had half of the book memorized already. And by the second day of rehearsal, he had the entire script. And this is a lot of pages completely memorized. And so everyone was breathing a huge sigh of relief. But see, those two things happened this week. And I thought, you know what? I think the gods are kind of telling me that I need to talk a little bit about memorization in general, and then be very, very specific about how your memory can be beneficial and how sometimes it can get in the way of good work. The first thing about memorization is a lot of actors put themselves in undue pressure for thinking they have to have this script really memorized before their audition. And if they don't have it memorized, they're not going to look professional. Well, I'm here to tell you straight up, don't memorize your first audition for anything, for a film, for a television project, for a theater project, whatever it is, you don't and shouldn't memorize the script. And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why. Number one, I've seen it too many times where actors are thinking that it's impressive that you've memorized the script. But here's the problem with that. I oftentimes will see the actor struggle with the words because now the audition becomes an exercise in memory. And that's not helpful at all. Now you're struggling for the words and, you know, maybe the author's in the room if it's a play and you've got the playwright sitting in the room um, and you're starting to mess up words just to try and struggle through it. Um, that can be a complete disaster. It can be really, really upsetting for both you and for us. So please, please, please. Do all the work that you need to do to be as familiar with the work, and you would become naturally familiar anyway, right? As you're working on the script and you're working out the beats, you're working out the intentions, you're working out all of the things that you want to work out in the particular script to make it interesting and, and take your point of view, um, what's the character behaving like, all of those things that you know to do as an actor. You probably... My guess is you're probably going to have it memorized pretty much anyway. But do not, under any circumstances, put the script down and try and wing it, especially in a first audition. Only because, like I said, it's that exercise in your memory, and I really would rather have you make points. Now, conversely, I will tell you this. I've seen actors who spent very little time on the script, very little time doing their homework, and now their nose is buried into the script so much that it's absolutely pointless for us to tell whether or not that actor is capable of playing that part. So that's definitely not a good thing to do either. So do the homework. Understand what's going on in the scene. Break down that scene into any of its components that are easy for you to understand and digest. Come up with a point of view for that particular character. Do all the work that you know to do. 
but make sure you walk in, you're still holding the script. Now, the second reason why I think you should hold the script in the first audition, it's a subliminal reminder for both the director and the casting director and the writer and the producer. You're subtly reminding us that this is an audition. So there's a kind of a contrarian view, right? Is that on one hand, you want to show how well you've prepared. And then on the other hand, you want to make sure that you're reminding everybody, this is just a, an idea of how I would like to play this part. So don't think of it in two different terms. They can both go hand in hand. And one is being very confident because you have the script. Now you're not, you're removing completely that, oh my gosh, I have to memorize this. But also... You're reminding us that, you know, this is a work in progress. This is something that we're working toward. And this is my take on how I would play this character. So that's why in a first audition, please do yourself the favor. Don't stress out. Just do good work. That's the most important thing. Now, here's the other thing. You get a call back. Yay! You get a call back. Woo! You know, the best feedback sometimes you're ever going to get is a call back. You're never going to get the director singing your praises or the casting director saying, you are fantastic. No, there's another step, and it's the callback. And so if you do get a callback, my guess is, especially for a film and television, you're probably going to have the scene memorized. And if you're comfortable to be off book, that's the logical next step. So I'm not saying that that's a, a must, but I am saying that it's pretty much a good thing because it shows your due diligence as to having worked on the part, and now you're showing me even more about what you're capable of. Um, a little side note, especially in film and television, make sure that what you did in your first audition is something you, here's a good word coming up, something you replicate in the second, in the callback. In other words, Remind the director and the producer what you did in the first audition by doing exactly what you did in that first audition. More likely than not, the director might want to throw an adjustment your way, want to maybe tweak something in the script a little bit just to see how you take adjustments. So that's why I would have it memorized, but I wouldn't be so, you know, married to my own memory that I can't make adjustments, especially in a callback. So those are the two things that I wanted to share about auditioning. But now let's talk a little bit about let's get the part. Now, um, I have to confess, uh, as old as I am, <laughs> as older as I get, I am um, realizing that there, and this is absolutely true, there are certain memory issues that just happen. Now, I could spend, you know, a hundred podcasts talking about how much I hate that part of getting older. Um, there's so many things to like about getting older. That just doesn't happen to be one of them. And many actors of a certain age will find it particularly more challenging to memorize material. And I think that I'm going to address that. Maybe there you're out there and maybe you say, gosh, that hasn't been an issue for me, but maybe I should at least listen to, are there some techniques that I can use? But let me also say that if you're cast in something, so you've gone from the audition, now you've gotten the call back and now you're in rehearsal. If you stress because you have a hard time memorizing lines, we need to take a look at that. And let me just base it on my experience as both an actor and now as a casting director, I can share with you that when we started blocking the show, if this is a play, for example, when we started blocking those those scenes or the directors blocking out moments within a scene, I started associating that in physical movement, those physical places that I'm at within the given parameters of the the scene, I start connecting those two things together. It's as if the muscle memory says, okay, I'm moving over to the table to get a cocktail because I just can't take it anymore and I need a drink. So you see, I'm, I'm now thinking in terms of why I'm going over to that table and that triggers the memory for the right words at that time. So I'm making an association with what I am thinking and feeling with the words I'm supposed to be saying. Because after all, as actors, we're interpreting the author's words, and we need to kind of find a way 
to make that happen seamlessly. So one of the things that really is helpful is marrying the movement on stage, the blocking on stage with the words. Now, film, of course, is a little bit different. But here's my suggestion. Instead of being concerned about blocking, although blocking is really <laughs> critically important in a lot of film scenes and in a lot of work, so it's very difficult sometimes to tell you, give you a, a you know, a broad kind of way to think about it. But here's the thing. If you are able to marry the words with the internal intention that the character is feeling, then what you have going on is another kind of association, not dissimilar to the blocking that you do in theater. For example, if you know that you, this is this is something that's making you really angry and really upset and you're about to explode, you know, pretty much the words are also going to be there. And so that connective tissue between what you're feeling internally and what the words are will be easier for you to remember those words. I tell you what's not easy to do, and that is to sit back at night before going to bed and try to repeat read the words and repeat the words over and over and over again, hoping that somehow they're going to sink into your brain and you're going to magically wake up and have all of this wonderful memory. That's just not, not going to happen. So those are some things to consider. Make those kinds of associations and you're going to find yourself in a much, much better place, I think. Now, finally, I just wanted to say that when you can do your words out loud, when you can hear yourself do the words, that's a much stronger thing for you than to just simply read the words and hoping you're going to remember them. Saying them out loud gives you a really great mechanism by which you can make those emotional associations. So doing them out loud. There are also some things that you can do, which is, um, I've done this before, is that you can literally record the other person's lines so that you can then insert your own lines live. Does that make sense? That's kind of weird, though, because what happens is you only give yourself this much time to say your lines and you don't want to get necessarily into a rhythmic pattern because you're playing all of the parts. So be wary that that could pose some problems. But now I'm told that there's an app. There's an app for learning your lines. And you know what? I, I, I don't know what the name of the app is. So if anyone knows what the name of the app is so that you can download, so that you can learn your lines. Apparently, there's a way that you can adjust the timing of those lines, and you can change your voice so that the other character can have a different voice even. So if you know what, what the app that is, I would love to find out, and I'd be happy to share that with you in our next episode of Casting Actors Cast. Gosh, we're a little bit over time today, but I hope that you uh, found some value in some of these things. Really important that you don't stress over memorization. It's just one of those tools in your toolkit. That's the way to think about it. And make associations that can help you feel comfortable within the parameters of the character that you're playing. And you're going to be in great shape. Hey, listen, have a great week. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for tuning in to Casting Actors Cast. I couldn't be more excited that you're tuning in. And I really hope you tune in next week. And please don't forget to uh, check us out on YouTube. You can like and subscribe and all that cool stuff. And uh, it would really mean a lot if you took a few minutes, a few moments to do that. Thank you so much again. I'm Jeffrey Dreisbach, and this is Casting Actors Cast. You've been listening to Casting Actors Cast, the podcast for actors with Jeffrey Dreisbach. Please share with your friends, subscribe to this podcast, and oh yeah, if you like this podcast, just click like. It's easy. I'm Caitlin Clark.